Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this LSE public event. My name is Chris Anderson. I'm a professor in politics and policy in the European Institute here at the LSE. Uh, this event is titled One Step Ahead, Mastering the Art and Science of Negotiation, and it's sponsored by the School of Public Policy. We will be speaking about the newly released book by David Sally of the same title, and speaking of which, I'm thrilled to welcome two of my very favorite academic colleagues and scholars and people in the world. Um, they've always been one step ahead of me, that's for sure. So I look forward to listening to them and their conversation. So let me start with one of them. Let me start with Professor David Sally, who is a leading behavioral game theorist. Uh, Dave has taught negotiation at Cornell and Dartmouth Business Schools. Uh, he's done so for over 20 years. It also so happens that we co-wrote another book called The Numbers Game, Why Everything You Know About Football Is Wrong. That's a book about football analytics that's been translated into over a dozen languages. And over, I think almost 10 years ago now, Dave and I founded a uh, football analytics consulting firm, and we've worked with various clubs and clients in the world of football around the globe. But this is not a session about football. This is a session about one step ahead. And so get, let me give you a bit of a preview uh, of one step ahead, which has already received various accolades. Um, for instance, I think it's received a starred review from Library Journal as a comprehensive guidebook deliver, delivering valuable skills. It was one of Publishers Weekly's top 10 recommended books of the summer of 2020. Um, this is a really nice accolade. It was called a deep, thoughtful masterclass on the negotiation game by Kirkus Reviews. And economist Bob Frank has blurbed it as being destined to become a classic. Um, and uh, it, brave game theorist Colin Cameron called it a beautifully written book, which is wise, funny, scientific, and practical. Most importantly, of course, to Dave himself, as he's told me, uh, former diplomat, UN diplomat Gianni Pico, who maybe you don't know this yet, uh, who bravely and single-handedly freed the Western hostages held by Hezbollah in Beirut in 1991, and whose story is the core of chapter seven, uh, says that one step ahead helped me realize who I truly was as a negotiator. So that's high praise uh, between economists and UN hostage negotiators. Um, I think there's a lot in this book that we look forward to hearing about. Dave joins us from his home in Ithaca, New York. Uh, the other most important person this afternoon is Professor Kathleen O'Connor. Kathleen received her PhD in organizational psychology and is a clinical professor of organizational behavior at London Business School, just down the road from LSE. Uh, she's an authority on the collaboration, conflict resolution, and her research has been honored by leading academic organizations, including the Academy of Management and the International Association of Conflict Management. In addition to her scholarly writing, uh, Professor O'Connor writes for Forbes.com as well as MIT Sloan Management Review. At London Business School, she also serves as the Director of Executive Education. And in 2020, this is also another sort of piece of high praise. She received the School Wide Excellent in Teaching Award. So um, I will shut up in just a second. Just let me just give you the ground rules for today. The ground rules are that we will have a conversation between Professors O'Connor and Sally for about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. If you're on Twitter, feel free to go crazy. Uh, use the hashtag if you do. Uh, the hashtag for today's event is LSE one step ahead, all one word, LSE one step ahead. And I think we're in for a treat. So my job now is to hand it over and listen. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Professor Chris Anderson. That was uh, quite an introduction. Wow, was, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great praise for the book. And I can, I don't know if you want to use my blur, but I thought it was a great read. So, um, so you can feel free to, to use that if you want. I'll, I'll even write it down. Definitely. For you. We'll add it to the, add it to the unfortunately short list, but you know, no, no it's fabulous. Really. So, I, I've, I've read it. I've read it a couple of times now. It's absolutely my pleasure uh, to dig in into it today, so, so thank you. Um, so let's, let's get started. Actually, what I will tell the audience is that the format of this was for Dave to speak for about 15, 20 minutes and then for me to ask questions, but it, uh, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear that Dave negotiated the terms of his appearance here. And we will actually uh, jump right into the Q&A. And I've asked him as he answers some of his questions that maybe he shares with us some reading things from the book. So I think that's how we're going to do it. Is that right, Dave? That was your negotiation? That is totally correct. Yeah. I, I think that's a fine characterization of the negotiation too. Exactly. Nice. Less work for sure. me. And yeah, <laughs> I don't want to have to give a talk. 
<laughs> Why not? Let's have a conversation. Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. And and by the way, so as as uh, Chris mentioned, we're going to have a bit of a chat, and then we're going to open up the questions. So you should feel free to ask away if anything. If you're prompted uh, and moved, uh, please please do that, and we will manage you in a little while. Oh, really, Chris, yes, really, really quickly, one piece yeah. of information for the audience. Yeah. If you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A box that, is, that you can find on your Zoom screen. We will be monitoring that box. And then uh, Kathleen will be taking those questions from the Q&A box. OK, Perfect. so go Great. right ahead. OK, thanks so much for the note. So Dave, I remember in the before times, this was um, before, my, I mean, before pandemic times when I would go through an airport and I would stop uh, frequently in the bookshop and see, you know, shelves with business books. And, and some of them were negotiation books. And so, you know, knowing how many are out there and how many are probably on the shelves of the folks who have tuned in for today, um, what was missing from those shelves that inspired you to write One Step Ahead? It's so funny because um, the, uh, the goal of this <laughs> in pre-pandemic times, the, the the fantasy in writing the book was that it was going to be in airports all around the globe with a nice little cardboard display and all of us busy travelers, business travelers going through the airports. People would look at the at the bright red cover of one step ahead and say, wow, that looks kind of interesting. Of course, we're not, we're not in those times. But I did. I did think in writing the book, as I, as I detail in the preface to the book, that there was a gap in all the literature. And I thought the gap was uh, comprised of a couple things. But the main thing was when I, as, as I think happens with your students as well, negotiations is a great course to teach to executives or to business school students or to policy students. And it's something that people get very excited about. Um, and at the end of the quarter, they would say, well, what else can I do? What can I study? And my advice would be, well, read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is a, a classic of, of human interaction and understanding how to, um, how to convince people, how to influence people, as the title says. And then I had my students during the class read a little bit of Getting to Yes, but not the whole thing. But they said, you have to read Getting to Yes, read the whole thing and understand it. And then I said, you know, then I, I, there are some other really great books out there, but there's nothing that really hits the sweet spot of getting deep below the surface and what's really going on in the negotiation game for somebody who understands the basics, somebody who understands some of the principles of getting to yes, but maybe uh, in reading it doesn't realize some of the limitations of it. And someone who appreciates kind of the folk wisdom of how to influence people, but then says, if you read it carefully, he's, he's coming up with numbers that he comes up with a 90% number of 90% of people will be convinced by this, but that's, he did no scientific research. There's no science behind it. So I felt like there was a book that could combine the science of psychology and in particular behavioral game theory with a broad overlook of what is really going on in a negotiation game and, and um, with a level of sophistication and knowledge that more advanced readers would find uh, appealing. And, right. and my goal in the book was to present science at a very, some of the chapters are very macro, very like how does language, how do words work? What do we know about emotions? But at the same time, try to drill down to very specific pieces of advice for what does this mean for you as a as a negotiator, whether you're a policymaker or a diplomat or a business person. Nice, thank you. I, I think I think you're right to say Fisher and Yuri's getting to yes is is pretty basic and it's a nice introductory um, book. But it also, as you suggest, has some limitations, and I think we'll talk about that. So, why did you title your book about negotiation, which is what this is, um, one step ahead? Why why was that the the title that's that that you had in your mind? 
It's a great, it, it's a great question because it's such a, it's the most anodyne phrase in the world. It's the most boring, like one step ahead. It's just cliche. It's, and I hope, I hope I can uh, present right now, but also in the book, help the audience uh, that's with us here today. And thank you all for joining us. Appreciate a little bit more about what, what this anodyne, anodyne phrase really means. So the phrase one step ahead relies on a, a, a part of behavioral game theory that's grown in the last 20 years um, that uh, economists and game theorists refer to as level K thinking. And the idea is, and this fits with um, what many people who think about strategic interaction in particular, Irving Goffman, the great American sociologists of the 1950s and 60s, knew to be true, but the idea that human beings are distributed on a staircase of knowingness and sophistication, and that there are people in a given um, interaction, such as a negotiation, who are not behaving strategically at all. They don't, they may be lost, they may be irrational, they may be overly emotional, but they are people who are zeros. They are zero, they are level zero thinkers. And this behavioral game theory says, well, you can think about people distributed across this staircase of knowingness and cunning and sophistication from zeros, ones, twos, and threes and beyond. And Irving Goffman, as I mentioned, did great work in the 50s on con artists and spies and people like that who, who had a lot riding on understanding how deep into the game, whether it was a deal, a fake deal that was being made, whether it was intelligence work, how deep the counterpart was. And if I could read a little bit about um, Goffman's conclusion. Please. Goffman said, the important thing is, so looking at us all from his own little empirical corner and observing how we really negotiate, dispute, con, spy, cooperate, present ourselves, and converse from different levels on the strategic staircase, Goffman identified the ideal spot. The game theory assumption that one's opponent is exactly as smart as oneself is not a wise one in daily affairs. The subject must put a stop to the cycle of moves and counter moves at the point he thinks will be exactly one step ahead of the furthest step that the observer takes, regardless of how much more devious the subject could be if necessary. One step ahead. Ideally, you don't want to be behind or even Stephen, nor do you want to be more clever or crafty than is necessary. You have gained an advantage, but you have not lost touch with your counterpart. So the idea that most easily summed up is in some ways you want the advantage. You don't want to necessarily uh, be in reality behind your counterpart. There's a separate subject, which we may stop, uh, touch upon on whether you want to appear to be behind your counterpart or not. But in reality, you don't. You want to have some kind of advantage, but you want to be nearby. You want to be one step ahead, just a single step ahead. And it's probably best characterized in uh, the phrase from the playwright David Mamet, who in one of his plays said, you can't bluff someone who isn't paying attention. So why, why spend time? If, if my counterpart is not paying attention in the negotiation, why am I bluffing? Why am I coming up with sophisticated, complex offers? And if I could read one more yeah, great please. illustration that will... Mm -hmm keep this in, in people's idea, uh, in people's minds about uh, another great example of somebody getting too complex and too strategically complex. We have to go to um, professional basketball in the NBA and Michael Jordan, who one of the highlights of our pandemic, right? The, the, the Michael Jordan documentary yep. got us through a lot of hours of the pandemic. Yep. So this is the story told by Steve Kerr, who we now know is the, as the coach of the Golden State Warriors, won many championships, who actually became one of Jordan's teammates on the Bulls. But early in his career, when he was a young player, he played for the Cleveland Cavaliers. So this is the story he tells about when he was a young player and found himself defending Jordan early in his career. 
Kerr, who would eventually become Jordan's teammate on the Chicago Bulls, recounts the superstar's mistake. And he, Jordan, did this head fake. And he faked one way. Then he faked the other. And then he went back to the original way. And I was so faked out by the first fake that I was still there. And so I actually stayed in front of him because I was too slow to go for the second fake. He kind of faked himself out. I stayed in front, challenged his shot, and he missed it. And there was a timeout. In the huddle, my coach, Lenny Wilkins, goes, guys, you got to stay in front of Jordan like Kerr just did. I didn't have the heart to tell him it was by accident. It was actually Jordan himself who kept Kerr in front of him. So the right. idea that you can be too sophisticated right. in certain situations is. And that, and I think so, yeah. And, and that does come up when we teach negotiation, doesn't it? That, that the students spend all semester or, you know, when we do workshops and organizations or in our consulting work, that, that people spend all this time kind of negotiating and practice with each other and say, but what about out there kind of in the real world when I'm negotiating with people who haven't learned all these tactics. And there's where I think as, as, um, as you would say, this notion is stay just one step ahead, right? You, you don't wanna misread how clever they are one way or the other. So, so taking that, oh, go ahead. Did you wanna say no, that? No, that, no, you're exactly right. In, in a way, right, we're, we're taking, we're, we're, we are taking students in a class up the staircase together, recognizing right. that there's a distribution that some people are more experienced than others, yep. but then they don't realize, well, wait a sec, I'm, I'm negotiating in this class for the whole quarter or in this week in an executive program. We've all kind of moved up the staircase together. That's right. And now you got to think about um, the real right. world. Where That's right. And the reconnaissance you have to do, the, the way you have to use your network to really try to get a handle on who the other person is and not make those assumptions, right? Or be willing to challenge and correct those assumptions becomes really important. So I guess I want to take that general idea of one step ahead. And now if we can make it really tactical, because I know that whenever I listen to these talks, I'm like, okay, tell me what to do boss, right? Like, tell me what I need to do differently. I sure I'll read the book, but in the meantime, give me one or two things I need to do. So that's where, that's where I want to take this. So let's make this super tactical if you could give you know a couple three whatever it is we can we see how much time we have give people a piece of advice that they could take into the world you know monday morning kind of is there a piece that you would give them is there something you would start with um yeah again i i i i i i, I want to um think about kind of macro ideas okay. kind of larger ideas, but also very tact, very micro ideas. So let's, let me, in the interest, I, I, I totally agree with you that um, uh, let's not do too much macro yet. We can maybe circle back. So yeah. let's talk about something really specific. Let's talk about um, don't refuse with the word can't. Okay. So there is a very lovely study, which you probably know, um, in the linguistics of, of saying no to people. So if you're doing it in English, um, if uh, you have a customer in a store and they say, um, or a, a, a client, um, I would like to have a discount. And uh, your response is, I can't give you a discount. What the counterpart hears, can't is a word that is ambiguous between I am unable and I am unwilling. And what you may not realize when you use the word can't because your mistake is you're just, you know how you mean it, but you haven't gone to thinking through what the response and what the counter response is. You don't realize that you're actually signaling to the other side it's this ambiguity and they are very happy to say that it is just that you are um, unwilling not that you're right. unable mm -hmm. so the advice is it turns out to be super effective instead of saying i can't offer a discount to say i don't offer a discount and the word don't signals to the other side, once you think about it really deeply, that you are unwilling and you are unwilling for structural, potentially moral purposes. Um, and it makes it much more effective with the counterpart. So 
understanding the way that language works and the way that words are received and thinking through in a very tangible way, I say in the book, as you think about the script that you're going to use in a negotiation, what statement you're going to make, what possible response there is from the other side, and what your counter response then is. So the word don't is a great example. And it turns out that it's not only in negotiations, but if you say to your friends, again, in pre-pandemic times, I can't go out tonight to the pub, mm -hmm. that signals one thing, but I don't, I don't go out after, mm -hmm. you know, before, right. before going to work the next day. Don't, right. or using it for self-control. I can't mm -hmm. do this. I don't mm -hmm. do this. Right. So the word can't, and the, the words can't and the words don't. Yeah. It's like that whole notion of saying, I love that distinction. It's like, you know, my hands are tied. You know, it's not clear who tied your hands, whether it was you right. or someone else. But the idea is, you know, I don't do that. Right. There's this. And you can assume it's structural or whatever it is, but it draws that line to make it very clear. That's my backstop. So that's really nice. Very, very nice. Is there another one that you would give us? You sure, know, sure. super practical. I'm like, give oh, me yeah, give super me practical, Kath. Absolutely. Give me I'll take one more and then I'll ask you something else. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, how about, and I think this is the, the last chapter in the book is about numbers, uh -huh. quantitative. And I got to be honest, I think there's a number of, of, contributions that the book makes to to the literature in general about ideas there's there's really not been a lot in the negotiation literature about strategic sophistication of these ideas of levels of knowingness that people are on yeah. but also i think there's um there's a lack of work on on there are individual studies but nobody's really pulled it together on kind of quantitative factors in a negotiation mm -hmm. and the use of numbers and there's some great individual studies but the message, the very tangible message is stop thinking of numbers like numbers. Numbers are more like words than you realize. A number can be accepting and round. A number can be lucky. A number can be tough. A number can be precise. Mm -hmm. And the chapter deals with um, what we know from the early studies, um, the early uh, bargaining studies on, on the way that numbers affect counterparts. So let me give you a very tangible example. Round numbers are inviting. Round numbers that end in zeros or end in five or uh, are, an, uh, are like an open door to say, come and make an offer to me, this nice round number. Whereas precise numbers that are out to decimal points with different levels of precision end up signaling knowingness to the counterpart mm -hmm. end up signaling toughness a mm -hmm. willingness to refuse the offer mm -hmm. but that is also as the studies show that is very dependent on your own level of expertise your own in, in a particular domain and the level and always 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 if we're thinking one step ahead we're thinking about where our counterparts are mm -hmm. and and the expertise of the counterparts so in a real estate, in, a, in an experiment on real estate transactions, it turns out that using very, uh, I think this was an experiment done on like a, a manufacturing plant, something mm -hmm. like that. It turned out that, that for people who were inexperienced in real estate, who were students or something like that, very precise numbers turned out to be a, a, a very effective offers. But if you dealt with the subpopulation in this experiment of, of people who had um, 10 or more years of experience mm -hmm. in real estate, mm -hmm. if you tried to give them an offer um, or suggest a sale price for this plant of 10,235,886.27 euros, right. it had no effect. It had no anchoring effect on the mm -hmm. counterpart. They said, you're, you're just making crap up. Right. You're using false precision. Right. So thinking about so thinking about numbers and quantitative factors mm -hmm. as and numbers in particular as more like words than you mm -hmm. realize mm -hmm. is one way to. I love it. So if that, so, so I love that idea, Dave, it so resonates. It makes so much sense that the more precise you are, the more I'm led to believe you must've really done some homework to figure that out to the, to the dollar, right? To the pound, whatever that is. 
Um, and, I, and I can see the point that if you're an expert in this, this is just one more thing. I'm not sure anything really. Then, then you go to other tactics, right? So the number yeah. tactics may not be as effective. Number tactic not available. Right. But I love that little tip to use some more precision in some of these odd numbers, right? In your kind of everyday transactions. So that can be, it could be a really good one. And then maybe have some argument for it, right? If they press on that a little bit, kind of why is that? You've got it, right? You know what it is, right? Always. So, that's the yeah. that's the statement response counter response. Oh, Dave. Well, you come okay. up, right? Thanks, I got Dave. a number. I got an offer. That's I got right. a number. They're going to object to the number. What's my counter response? That's well, right. I better be thinking about that. Gorgeous. That's, that's the point. You, may, you highlight this in the book, and I think it's really nice for anyone who's doing, um, really, who is reading the book to become a better negotiator. And there's so much in here for them. But that stuck out for me as someone who knows a lot about negotiation, been teaching it for 25 years, right? Same as you. That notion of statement response, counter response. We often think about our statement. We often don't think about their response, right? That's one of the ways we underprepare. But then you go further to say, if you map out all the, right, the, the entire universe of possible responses, you have to be ready with the counter response. What are you gonna say when they say that? And what are you gonna say when they say that? And, and it's you know going that as you would say be one step ahead. It's not enough to prepare for the response. How are you gonna how are you gonna counter that, right? And, it's and also flipping that right. Yeah, I'm anticipating counterpart statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, how am I gonna answer that? And then yeah. and then and now yeah. and now we're getting very sophisticated. But it's but it's possible, right? That's yeah. the I'm gonna think about my response, but then how are they gonna answer that? And and now we're in a world, and I think this is, so there's, there's kind of three totemic people in the first chapter that mm -hmm. for me together kind of represent, and now I'm, I'm going kind of the macro yep. view of Machiavelli, mm -hmm. Irving Goffman, who we've mm -hmm. already mentioned, and yeah. Yuja Wang. Mm -hmm. So Machiavelli, I think there's been a lot of a great recent research to make us some of us, if you read that, to reconfigure how we think about Machiavelli. And because traditionally a, he's been conceived sort of the the right, the 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 impersonate the the you know, what is it, the personification of just sort of ruthless self-interest. Ruthless. Yes. Ruthless. Self -interest. ruthless. The right. the ends justify whatever means you have, That's right. right? That's right. So how are and, we rethinking him? And you can and you can look in in some of his writings, some of his so so we have the beauty of having his letters. Um, that uh, the book opens or chapter one opens up with him being uh, on a mission as an envoy for his right. home city of Florence, trailing the court uh, of Caesar Borgia trying to figure out whether Borgia is going to attack Florence or not. Um, and he is, he is having a continuous set of negotiations with this very ruthless prince who would become the prince of the prince. And he would write letters back to the city fathers. And Machiavelli was a smart guy. He knew that Borgia's men were intercepting the letters and reading them. So you read things in his letters or you read certain selections of the prince that seem to justify this or that seem to portray him as just the epitome of evil, like whatever it takes to get mm -hmm. the ends that you want. But he was being, he knew he was being spied upon. He knew his words were being, uh, he had all kinds of a, a political agenda. So he was smart enough to be able to use the flexibility of what he was writing to indicate one thing to an audience right. who is unknowing and another thing to an audience who is knowing. And I prefer to think of Machiavelli as, as a cunning pragmatist. So I don't want readers to be Machiavelli in because that, mm -hmm. that, that's a horrible phrase these days, right? It's, it's right. like sociopathic. But I right. want them to be Machiavelli-esque. I want you to realize that there are many things that you, there are illusions that people have about negotiations, mm -hmm. just like there are illusions about who Machiavelli actually was, that he was just a, a very strategic pragmatist who was in a horrible situation, whose life was on the line every time he walked into the darkened throne room at Borgia, mm -hmm. um, who literally had to save his neck, who had no money, only his wits and mm -hmm. he had to he had to negotiate his way out of that and I think to to one thing that both you and I know from teaching 
and that I think Machiavelli um, uh, uh, laid out in one of his letters. So he he wrote he wrote um, to uh, after he retired, he wrote to some of his successors who were going to be envoys uh, on behalf of Florence, and he said he wrote them and said. Um, when it comes to, to your negotiations, you ought to have no difficulty making the right conjecture and weighing what the emperor's intentions are, what he really wants, which way his mind is turning, and what might make him move ahead or draw back. Mm -hmm. One writer observes that Machiavelli's deep insight was that a negotiator was, quote, expected to bring the gifts of a psychologist to the task of a prophet. Machiavelli was gifted just so, and in the end, in the face of a terrifying, ruthless duke, he would later make infamous in his most legendary book, The Prince, he was successful in keeping both his body and his hometown intact and unscathed. And part of that letter is this idea that you can do it, right? Part of what we do with our students or executives mm -hmm. is, I know I can make you a better negotiator right. you need to understand right. you can become that you can do this right. this knowing that you can take your personality that you can get better at this negotiators are great negotiators are made and not born that's right is a really important quality and i think that's part of what machiavelli represents is in mm -hmm. his understanding of the game was that he could get himself better he believed that other envoys for florence could mm -hmm make themselves more effective yep. negotiators. And that animates the book. I believe by yep. reading the book, you will become a much smarter and better you negotiator. Will. Yeah, there's no chance. I, 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 I like that idea. I think that one of the things, one of the reasons why you would take part in a negotiation course, whether it's in a, uh, um, whether it's as a student or as an executive, is because of the confidence it enables you to build, right? You, you can read a book and you can learn something and it's gonna be very powerful for people to, I think, pick up the book and pick up some of the tactics that you're very clear um, about here. And then there's also just the, the constant practice where you're able to negotiate for lots of things all the time. You've got this sort of notion of, now you're very clear in the very early chapters though, and we're not gonna get into this here, I don't think, but it's a very interesting that you start the book with the idea that you know you don't negotiate for everything, my friends, right? Sometimes it's just easier to pay the cost, pay the pay the amount of money. But that is not going to help you sell this book to tell people not to negotiate. So I am not going to get to that. If you want to read Dave's very thoughtful chapter on when you should not negotiate, you gotta buy the book, my friends. Instead, I want to go in a slightly different, uh, a slightly different place. Um, you mentioned it yourself, so. Um, how has writing this book, so reading it will make us better negotiators. How has writing this book made you a better negotiator? Has it made you a better negotiator? I would assume it must. I think so. Yeah, shy, Dave. This is I not so. the time for modern. No, no. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I, I will say, I will say uh, the last 12 months have presented far fewer opportunities to yeah. negotiate. So I think that's you know, true for most of us. Amazon right? doesn't negotiate. What can I say? Yeah. You know? Uber Eats fair. doesn't negotiate, yeah, fair damn enough. it. <laughs> fair enough. Um, no, I think I have. And I think, look, I think there are a number of reasons. I feel like, as all writers do, you, you write about something that you're trying to figure out. Right. Um, I, I've taught negotiations as you have for many years. I thought I knew a lot, but sitting down to actually put together a framework to understand and to, and to sort through and I, and I hope the book does that for readers, is sorting through a ridiculous amount of science that's out there, different ideas that are out there, try to talk about you know, what, what is right, um, what is just wrong, what is right, but in a very limited context. But I think one key idea, and it comes to the second totem, which is Irvin Goffman, who we've already mentioned. Er, Goffman gave us, the title of the book, One Step Ahead from his, his work on, um, on strategic interaction. But he also gives this framework that I take quite seriously in the book, which is uh, the subfield of sociology he invented called dramaturgy, dramaturgical sociology. What does that mean? It's, it goes back to Shakespeare. Let's take it 
really seriously that life is a stage. Life, social life is a drama. Social life is theater. What is, let's suppose instead of again, that just being a cliche, we take that really seriously. Then we're all playing roles. We're playing roles in different domains of life. This part of life, we take the role of parent. This part of life, we take the role of professor. This part of life in a negotiation, we take the role of a negotiator. That, that distancing, that idea turns out to be really, really rich in terms of making you think about life or negotiation as a drama. It emphasizes the need to understand your script, the idea that you're just playing a role, which is one of the most, for people who are worried about conflict and the conflictual element of negotiations, the idea that you're just playing a role, distance your own heart from, mm -hmm. this is what I have to do. This is what the script calls for. I, I think there's a great quote from a Hollywood, uh, uh, a Hollywood producer, Linda Obst in the book from her memoir um, of her having to deal with the ridiculous environment and domain of Hollywood and the sexism and the, the, the incessant lying and how she got to a point where she could do it. And she said, I understood there was a great screenwriter in the sky and I had to follow the script. This is what I had to do. It wasn't me. But this is my role as a Hollywood producer. So, so this idea of a script. And where I'm leading is, um, and again, I'll read a little bit from, from Goffman. So Goffman, of all the ridiculous things, um, also wrote some stuff on professional wrestling, which is the ultimate of like talk fake. About, talk about acting, right? It's all about yeah, the talk acting. About, and talk about bad acting, right? That's right. Having, but, raised, having raised two 12-year-old boys come through my home, as, as I know you have as well. Yeah, yeah it's right. all about the wrestling, yeah. But he comes up with this phrase, which is where, to circle back to your question about where I think I am, I think, mm -hmm. I, I think I'm closer to having this phrase. So let me read from Goffman. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's writing in the 50s. He's writing with you know, when Gorgeous George was in the, uh, on, the, on the American television, I don't know if he was on UK television also, but I imagine, I imagine there was something in between football matches. There might have been some rest, professional wrestling. When we watch a television wrestler gouge foul and snarl at his opponent, we are quite ready to see that in spite of the dust, he is and knows he is merely playing at being the heavy. We seem less ready to see, however, that while such details as the number and character of the falls may be fixed beforehand, the details of the expressions and movements used do not come from a script, but from, and here's the phrase, command of an idiom, a command that is exercised from moment to moment with little calculation or forethought. And now this is me writing, by having command of the idiom, sophisticated negotiators can rehearse thoroughly and know the entire script backward and forward and yet improvise and be strategically spontaneous when the opening presents itself. This command naturally camouflages their role playing from the eyes of the counterpart. The less adv advanced negotiator merely plays the heavy and plow plods through their lines much like a maladroit company owner whose union opponent finally had to tell the first lawyer, quote, you are better off telling your client not to sit in the negotiations or not to speak because he is sending signals that some of my people are picking up and I know he does not mean what he is saying. So the idea of having, so myself having studied the idiom even more and thought about it more deeply and I hope readers of One Step Ahead would get to the same point, feel like I'm closer to having command of the idiom where I'm more aware of what's going on. I don't have to overthink things as much. I can prepare and we all should prepare really hard for a negotiation, but I'm less nervous and less fearful when I walk in. Mm -hmm. It helps, I love that idea that it, it helps if you think about yourself as sort of playing a role, you put on your sort of negotiation, whatever jacket and you walk in and, and it's less personal and it's more freeing and it, you know, all of that kind of thing. And the idea that if you've practiced the statement response, counter response, as you would, as you would advise, you can go in and kind of let some of it go, 
right? That and you- I think this is this is where this is where having role models, having uh, yeah. studying cases, or some yeah. of the great. I, I mean, I, I don't want this. This book is, I hope, full of just stories that haven't appeared mm-hmm. elsewhere, mm-hmm. and certain people who I hope will sit with the reader. So, so the idea that. Not, not just that you're putting on a mask, but that actually my role, the character I'm playing, I'm playing Gianni Pico. Yeah. I'm playing yeah. the UN yeah. diplomat that Chris mentioned. I'm playing Lillian right. McMurray, who mm-hmm. uh, was a uh, housewife in Mississippi who founded one of the most successful record labels of the early 1950s. I'm playing Charlene Barshevsky. I'm playing right. Xi Jinping. I am, I can inhabit a character and take that in the same way that an actor did. So yeah. there are all kinds of elements of, of very specific advice in the book that once you take this Goffman's insight seriously and play around with it, you realize there are all kinds of tangible pieces of advice. Like for instance, being more aware as modern acting uh, manuals are to how important the body is to mm-hmm. playing this role or to a character right. using bodily motions to so imagine I'm saying no to the other side and the other side hands me a piece of paper the mm-hmm. bodily motion by which I take a formal paper offer or not take it right becomes part of how you yes. manage your own character and your mm-hmm. own psychology. Another great idea that I just had my students do this past year that I was very uncertain about. Yeah. Anna Devere Smith is a, is a famous mm-hmm. um, uh, MacArthur award-winning uh, director, actor who does these single person plays in which mm-hmm. she inhabits um, tens of characters and her idea for how do I how do I take a character how do I take a role she has the simplest method she records their words and she repeats them to herself over and over Mm -hmm. and over again so her idea is that the words that people say to you are uh, if you can inhabit them it's a way of both understanding a role that you may have for yourself, but also who your counterpart really is. Mm-hmm. What words is your counterpart actually using? Right. And to really do that and say them as a mantra. And she talks about it in her own memoir about when she was, she did this as a high school student. I think she was 14 years old and the teacher said, um, oh, she was in a drama class and she, sorry, she was in college. She was in her mm-hmm. first acting class and they had to memorize a monologue. And they had to say it over 14 lines over and over again. And she took something from Shakespeare and she she was an extreme example, but she describes how the apparition of the queen actually appeared. She saw the ghost of the queen. She saw this character literally appear to her that it and and I was skeptical, but I had my students do this last year. They produce some of the most amazing, powerful insights into themselves, into mm-hmm. what line I said, take same, same exercise, choose 14 right. lines, choose something, say it over, take half an hour, say it over and over what happens to your brain, see what mm-hmm. happens. And mm-hmm. honestly, there were some revelatory. So what happened? They, they transform their own. So, so say a little bit more about that, right? For those who haven't done this exercise before. So you you pick out a passage and you you say it out loud you over and over and over again and then when the students were transformed what specifically was transformed i think they're under they're, sometimes sometimes it was understanding of themselves okay on their reaction to it sometimes it was understanding i, I mean they took some um ranging from business uh settings to pr- very personal settings okay but they took the words of a parent the words oh. of a friend Okay. said them over and over again and did, didn't see the the counterpart of the other side manifest in a ghost-like shape mm-hmm. but got a far deeper understanding okay. of of the other side and actually let me let me read what I write about this mm-hmm. if I can find it mm-hmm. 
And then we'll go to some questions. I think we've got a, a list. Yeah, definitely. Of, yeah, nice questions. I want to make sure we can get our our patient audience in. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm not finding it. Okay. But let me read. Let, let me read one example though for yep. me of 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 sort of someone's words who I find, and and this is, goes back to what uh, coming from the cauliflower, um, which is one of the. So Gianni Pico, as Chris mentioned, was a UN diplomat, um, uh, an aide to Perez de Cuellar, who single-handedly um, freed 11 Western, Western hostages from Hezbollah being held um, in various locations, as it turned out, throughout the city of Beirut by Hezbollah. And to do this, he, he would... Um, leave New York or Geneva and he'd fly into Syria. He'd then cross the border at night to go to the Iranian embassy in Beirut. And he would then walk out, he would leave his security team behind. He would then walk out late at night onto the darkened streets, bullet pockmarked streets of Beirut and be, allow himself basically to be kidnapped by Hezbollah mm -hmm. with a hood put over his head, thrown into the back of the car, uh, taken to some disclosed location. And, and the chapter on, in, in One Step Ahead on Preparation starts with this scene of Pico being kidnapped for the first time. And he is um, taken to this white sheet, everything in this living room somewhere in Beirut is covered with white sheets. And two masked men come out in front of him as he's sitting on a white sheeted sofa and they begin to negotiate. And as it turns out later on, one of the, 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 the main counterpart that he had, the main interlocutor, as he would say, was mm -hmm. went by the uh, nom de guerre of Abdullah. Abdullah turned out to be Imad Munia, who is one of the most dangerous terrorists of the times. So, there's this initial meeting, and this is what I want to kind of read for the audience, and maybe we'll we'll go and take questions. But this idea mm -hmm. of of how of the power of one one other theme in the book is just the power mm -hmm. of words, the power understanding how powerful words really are, and how what you say matters so much. And um, and again, this is a very theatrical idea as well. So let me just read this. This is a critical moment in their very first meeting. Okay. We are back in the first living room, somewhere in Beirut, with every wall and object covered in white sheets. A masked man, Abdullah, sits across from Pico. This is their initial me meeting, and they're still trying to interpret each other. Abdullah, I don't understand it. Why would you risk your life? Because you know we can kill you to save somebody who is not a member of your tribe. The Italian has to abandon all his preparation, answer this loaded question, and solve this dramatic problem. We hear his inner dialogue, and this is taken from interviews with Pico. Pico to himself, what does he want? This is not a diplomatic question. This is something different. I can answer this in some ways, but if my answer is wrong, this is the end of the road. The way I will answer will set the stage to see if we go ahead with the story or not. So I'm not just answering for me, I'm answering for the people I am here to help, my son, they took away the picture of my son. What are you going to do with that picture now? Pico breaks the uncomfortable silence. I am here because I like to pay in advance. I like to pay forward. We can see Abdullah's eyes narrow skeptically. Pico, imagine the chances that you and I had to meet in our lives. You did not go to the same school I went to. You did not go to the same mosque church or whatever that I did, we didn't go to the same beaches to swim in the summer. However, I believe you have a son. Pico has guessed his way into a faux pas, mistakenly communicating that he may have information on who Abdullah really is. Abdullah, angrily, how do you know? Pico, look, look, I mentioned your son for this reason. The chances you and I would ever meet were close to 000 0.1, but we met. And now you can decide whether I get out of here alive or not. Now, 20 years from now, your son may meet my son, and he may decide to save his life or not. So you know what? I like to pay in advance. I pay for that possible meeting 
that your son and my son will have. I pay in advance. Abdullah, where the hell do you come from? Pico, I come from where everyone comes from, the cauliflower. You say to the children, mommy, where do babies come from? And we say, from the cauliflower. Abdullah, you really are mad. Pico, thank you. Yes, aren't we all? So coming from the cauliflower, so Pico's ability to come up with the words that would yeah. save his life and right. remarkable. Yeah, yeah, remarkable. So let me open this up to questions because you've got something, I think that's a little bit along that, along those lines. Let me see if I can grab it. There's a, there's a lot, um, there's a lot coming up here, about a dozen or so questions. So great. Um, Okay. Yeah, but I got to get I got to get them organized. I'm going to go I'm going to blow it up so I can see it. So um, speaking of this is from um, I'm just going to say people's first names. Um, this is from Marion. She asks, speaking of um, Machiavellian, Machiavellian statescraft, it's been argued that the so called mad mad approach to negotiation is becoming more and more prevalent in international negotiations witness Trump uh, Kim Jong-un, Boris Johnson with a hard Brexit threat. Do you see that development as well? And what are the implications for negotiators facing these cliff edge scenarios? I mean, I guess one of the questions is, is it, she's asking, um, is it becoming more common? And the second I would ask is, is it effective? Yeah. Um, yeah, is it becoming more common? I don't know. Um, I, I, I think not, uh, would be my, I, I, I will say first, I don't know. Uh, that is an empirical question, and I think it's a good empirical question. Mm -hmm. My sense is not. My sense is our, our knowledge of the man man negotiation strategy is becoming more well known because we're suffused with social media, we're, you know, global events um, uh, uh, happen. We get into our information stream with much more alacrity than they did. Uh, uh, the madman strategy uh, was Machiavelli and Borgia, arguably. Borgia playing a, a real or imagined madman. So my, my sense is it's not, but we just know more about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds is good. Is it effective? Sometimes yes. I mean, honestly, honestly, sometimes yes. And I think this goes to a big category in the book, which is the madman strategy is is one version of what we would call zero of how a, what a zero can be. Mm -hmm. So for some people, uh, can um, uh, economists in particular, part of the the insight from this level K, this behavioral game theory, economists are a weird bunch. They mm -hmm. couldn't believe you could take people into a lab with a very explicit strategic choice. And the people would do something irrational with with incent, you know, with incentives. They and you rewards. know what? They should have asked a psychologist, Dave. Well, I no think doubt. Been... That's the point, right? That's the point. That so zeros, in some sense, define the game because a a person who is one step into a game is is optimizing against in a world in which zeros dominate and then a two you know so it kind right. of zeros are super important for what you mm -hmm. have to do and a zero can be a zero because they're a mad person mm -hmm. because they don't understand the general advice that comes from the con artist game is zeros are terrible marks they are terrible people to have to deal with and one thing that one of the main ways to deal with a madman or to deal with a zero in general is you have to become a negotiator. You have to lead them to a single, a one level of strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. You can do that through a reward. You can see that with in, in the international example with um, uh, foreign aid to, Kim, to, to North Korea that's been tried at various times. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you try to turn into the negotiator, you become an educator, you become a, 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 a tempter, a tantalizer to say, mm -hmm. move toward one step of rationality, and then I can, I can deal with you. I can't deal with you as a madman. Right. 
I think the other the other place this comes into play is with another big factor that's talked about in the book that the, that the idea that the, a madman at certain times or somebody behaving irrationally mm-hmm. is owed a voice or owed a share of whatever process is going on that it's that well we we have to look at the U.S. right now with Marjorie Taylor Greene, the, mm-hmm. the QAnon representative from right. Georgia. She deserves no voice. Right. Machiavelli wouldn't talk to. What, why? Why? Right. Why do they have any role in the process at all? Well, right. it's fair. They're part right. of the international community. What? Why? Right. Why? Are we, right. Why are we, so? So there's this pull, especially from certain countries, certain nationalities, yeah. certain people of the argument about fairness. Like it doesn't right. matter that I'm a mad person. My voice counts just as much as your, no, it doesn't. Right. No, it doesn't. Right. That, that leads, Dave, that lead, you've got a number of questions here. Um, people want your sort of, well, I think some people want you to um, to weigh in on uh, Israeli, uh, Israel, Palestine. I, I think that that's a, a challenging one uh, for anybody on this on this call, but I'm gonna ask you a couple of these um, clear policy questions. So, yes. so, um, the negotiations between Iran and P5 plus one about the nuclear program, which is threatening the Middle East and GCC, uh, didn't include these countries. Don't you think this is not a sound negotiation? If it worked, is it going to work for the short or long term? That's one question. The second is following this, this is someone else, following this question, can you share thoughts on the need to restart negotiations between Israel and Palestine? How to restart and succeed when it seems one or both sides don't really want to negotiate? How can they do it? So I don't know how you want to handle these questions, but um, can you leave people out? What are the dangers of leaving parties out? Um, can you win in the short run and still and lose in the long run? Obviously, I'm just paraphrasing. But any thoughts yeah. on any of those questions? Um, I I would I would say this is probably maybe we can unite both these questions. Let me see if I can bring them both together through thinking about the negotiation as a drama and mm-hmm. realizing that a negotiation isn't limited to only one stage, to the public stage. So there's the story in the book of the of the, nego- the secret negotiations that took place between the IRA and uh, the UK government that happened backstage. And one of Goffman's insights into thinking about life is, is, is that we play certain roles on the front stage that we don't play backstage and that the backstage or various other stages are super important. And oftentimes um, I think negotiators fall into the, to the a trap of thinking of only the public stage, only one stage. This is where the negotiation happens. Right. No, it's not. The negotiation can happen here. So when we're thinking about um, uh, including or not including other parties. We can make a distinction between, well, here's this very public facing mm-hmm. stage where, okay, let's limit the parties. But then there are other potential right. stages and, and venues in which we can include. And I would hope for the mm-hmm. sake of that any good diplomat would want to make sure that those lines of communication um, are and those uh, 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 subsidiary alternate venue negotiations are happening. Mm-hmm. I think this is relevant to any situation where there's massive uh, public conflict, including Israel and the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. It's it can't start on the main stage. It can't start in public. Right. It's got to start in private. Mm-hmm. And there's a great example in the book of how uh, of how this took place in in India and Pakistan. Mm-hmm. the secret negotiations that went on, as well as, as I said, the, the, the very heroic figure of Brendan Duddy, the, mm-hmm. or the, the, the dairy uh, fish and chips right. proprietor who hosted right. talks between MI, MI5, MI6 and, and um, the IRA in, in his yep. back parlor. So, yep. thinking, so this- about, thinking about negotiation, not just as one, right. one thing, right. but Chances multiple are stages. Yeah, and chances are they're happening. Right, just because you don't Chances see it doesn't are they are, happen. yes, right. yes, odds you are. would guess, you would guess. Yeah, odds are. Although um, I have to say, right, we all know Jared Kushner solved that, so I don't know really what the question is Yeah, I don't know what about, we're talking about now. About, yeah, not to, yeah, not to, but, right, not to throw too yeah. much uh, Jared around. Uh, so let's see, so there are other bits of sort of advice, but there's um, some that are more on tactics. So let me see if I can pull some of them up. So 
Um, oh, here's one about sort of uh, cultural boundaries here. It's interesting how you highlight differences between can't and don't. You know, how does this work in, in cultural context in, in the Asia example? And I assume that the question is, you know, it's difficult to say no or no, right? Right. right. And so do you have anything you might offer there? Um, can't, instead of saying can't, you can say don't, but maybe it's right. a limited application. Yeah, no, I look, I think, I think you, I, I think the question is, is right, that it depends on, it, it, there are different, that there, you need to understand the cultural script as much as you can in many settings, although I will say a, a, a more sophisticated negotiator recognizes that there are some negotiations in which it plays to be the outsider who doesn't, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about nothing. We got to talk in English because sorry, I don't, you know, right. uh, to underplay it. So mm -hmm. I think part of the, uh, when it comes to tactics, mm -hmm. the real advance is there's like very few all purpose. I mean, you know this, they're very yeah. for few all purpose, like this is going to work everywhere. No, this right. negotiation is a much more complex game. Right. So uh, I would say that it, being uh, uh, being smart, learning as much as so, so there's the there's a distinction between how much you know and how prepared you are. This is really important and how much I show the other side. Right. I know or I'm prepared. Right. Those are two different decisions. Right. You and maybe this this is a, a, a relative truism. I always prepare. Right. I always try to know as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It's different from what do I show the other side. That's right. I might have a binder this thick. Do right. I want to bring on the, on the negotiation? Right. Do I bring that binder to the table? Right. right. Maybe, maybe not. Do, do I try to learn about it? So to bring it to the specific question, I try mm -hmm. to learn. I certainly want to be as familiar as possible with the culture mm -hmm. um, or the cultural script or how do I say no? How do I say yes? How do I be respectful and I want right. to and I want to I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing I'm I'm uh, uh, signaling to the other side that I'm listening mm -hmm. that I'm respectful mm -hmm. but the actual tactical like do I say do I portray myself more as an outsider do I mm -hmm. portray myself as fluent in the particular right. cultural script is a different decision got it I got it. Yeah, very much so. I get it. You can understand the um, the reason why you wouldn't say it, and then you make a calculation about how much you how you're going to play that. Yeah, I got let me, it. Let me give you the great uh, uh, on this cultural script. I'm just yeah. thinking of of Charlene Barshevsky and the way yep. that she said no uh, mm -hmm. to her to her. Um, so Charlene Marshevsky was the U.S. Yes, like, trade nego chief negotiator, right? Under Clinton, is that right? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And she, she, she was in. Actually, I can't. I won't find it. I'll, I'll do it from memory. But she was in, engaged in a in a negotiation over. Th this was under Clinton, as she said. And this, these were the years when. Um, uh, uh, DVDs and CDs were being. There were all kinds of IP issues, right? And her counterpart, and she, and she was had a very small team in the government, um, a large government building in Beijing, negotiating with the trade minister and with just a raft of a, a huge long table with lots on the other side of just her and you know two or three on her side. And the minister, the Chinese minister, said, made a take it or leave it offer. Mm -hmm. And Barshevsky said nothing. She continued to say nothing. She was in, in a way playing with the cultural script of politeness, mm -hmm. of anti, not Ameri not the American blah, 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 but quieter. And she went, she went even beyond. She knew what, what the norm was for not saying anything. She went beyond the, well beyond the American, the American norm is like this, right? right. But even beyond the Chinese norm, quiet, quiet. Finally, she, she broke after 45 seconds or so. She said, I think what you mean to say, minister, is that you would like me to take this offer and consider it overnight and get back to you. 
But if you really mean that this offer is take it or leave it, then I'm going to have to leave it and I will wish you good day. And so that's what she did. Right. She cut him a door, right? Cut him a door. Cut him a door. It's great. I love it. It's such a great example of that, right? That she didn't let him frame this for her. She took that, she responded to it, right? By saying, and thinking about this cultural script yeah, as an American right. woman. Sit quietly. How do you, yeah, you will. Yeah. She, 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 she hadn't planned that, right? but she had command of the idiom. She was fluid. She yep. could make decisions in the moment mm -hmm. to violate norms of quiet, to yep. violate taking someone else's words and reframing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She could do Very it. Very nice. Very nice. Um, I have a few more. We've got a number more. I'm, I'm, if, you're, if, you, if your question has been asked yet, it may very well be, but some of them are redundant and I'm moving them a little bit later in the conversation. So there's a question from a fellow here named Scott McLaughlin, Dave. Um, uh -oh. So I think he goes by Scotty. So he <laughs> writes, Dave, congratulations on the book. Um, so he's asking about, let's see, how much is negotiating about the physical interplay and behaviors um, and how much is it about kind of the cognitive bit, right? Like, is it in your, is it all in your head or is there something else about how you manage your body at the table? I think you made a little bit of it. You touched on this a little bit earlier. Scotty's question came in actually fairly early. So that's a great question, Scotty. If I could only grab your forearm and, and rub your bald head, I would do it. Um, <laughs> Look, at, at, at the most basic level, social life is, I quote, an uh, 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 early 20th century psychologist, Charles Horton Cooley, who has the most early 20th century American name, Charles Horton Cooley, who said the social life is an interweaving of minds. It's what does society is defined, and this is this eventually led to this idea that ourselves are just, it's, it's the, the, the mirror self, right? That we, that we mirror what other people do and what other people think of us and that we dress ourselves. So I got to answer Scotty at one level, of course, it's all mental. It's all, it's all of this, this social mind, this interweaving of what my mind makes of your mind. But the physical, I think the physical part of it is, is important to recognize the mind-body loop. And I think there are some instances where this has been, where the science doesn't bear out quite in the right way, but there are certainly other instances where the body does. And let me give, let me give a specific example that's, I, I think, critical in a way. So there was a, a 2016 Harvard Business Review article that was titled this. It said, the secret to negotiating is reading people's faces. So the advice in this 2016 article was, you got to learn how to read other people's faces. And even the author said, after you say something, wait four seconds before you say anything else and just look at the other person. And I got to say, if you're doing that, that is weird. That is, you better be doing that knowing that is super strange. That is just super weird. But I think when it comes to bodily clues, I think that the, the thing that, that you will learn from one step ahead is our instinct is that faces are super interpretable and able to be read. And that's a mistake. The, the science seems pretty clear. We way overestimate that we can tell from somebody's facial expression, whether they're happy, sad, whether they're serious about an offer, whether they're lying, it's just, we, we're not, we can't. But it turns out that even at the poker table, um, uh, you, are, you are better off reading somebody's arms and hands, the other bodily signals that they're getting. And so the more advanced negotiator is looking for those signals recognizes two things. One is that there may be more information coming from the rest of the body than the face. I'm not gonna worry so much about the face, but also that these are, that these are, are very subtle clues. And so I don't over rely on somebody kind of being nervous with uh, their hands or somebody eagerly grasping something or sitting forward and moving backwards. I recognize that as one small clue 
that I need to gather other information to understand somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Good answer. Uh, let's see. Let me keep moving. Make sure I get everything here. Um, let's see. Oh, is there any commentary on Brexit? A few people have asked about about Brexit. I don't know how closely, Dave, you've been following Brexit and and know about um, what's been happening. But uh, the question is really how well or badly did the EU and the negotiate and the UK negotiate? I know that that I know that Chris is still here, and I, I know that he's watched. Uh, there's been documentaries made about um, um, that really followed the Brussels team and some of their reactions to the UK team. And I'm sure he's happy to chime in on on you know as a Europeanist. Uh, but but any commentary there on how well they did or anything that you thought went particularly well or poorly or you're also able to beg off it as someone who's not a no I, I as an American as an ignorant American yeah no yeah. I uh, I follow it very closely obviously but but not I would love to see uh, 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 there's nothing I like more than seeing kind of behind the scenes I think I've seen little snips of the kind of with the European team the EU team. Chris, what I, was that document? Chris, excuse me, what was that documentary that followed? No, I don't remember exactly. It was uh, Barnier and his team, and I think right. it was a Belgian production, but that was shown on the BBC at some point. So I think it's a Belgian mm -hmm. uh, production. You can probably find it if you if you look online. But it's it's right. pretty fascinating. Uh, it's one sided. Right? It shows one yeah. of the parties, but uh, it was quite telling in in terms of sort of level of preparation and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, here's, here's, uh, here's how I'd like to answer this. To me, from what I know about it, it's a classic example of deciding a, a, a truth about a negotiation that we have leverage, they need us more than we need them, and never, ever rethinking it. And to bring this back to, we did two of the big totems in the book of Machiavelli and Goffman. The third one is Yu Jia Wang, the, mm -hmm. the extraordinary pianist from China. And she represents this other characteristic of advanced performance in any domain, whether it's the piano, whether it's football, whether it's teaching, writing, and most important for us, negotiating. And that is the idea that you have to work on two levels. The most advanced people are performing and monitoring. Yu Jia Wang is playing and listening to the red when she's, when she's doing a solo or with the orchestra. She's listening to, she's monitoring the conductor. She's monitoring her own performance. Negotiators who are very sophisticated as Footballers who are great are, are, think, are, are obviously in the moment have this ability to work on two levels. And to me, and that, and that is to, to be uh, delivering the offer to the other side, to be giving, to delivering the script, but at the same time saying, is this working or not? Am I, what, how are they reacting, right? How, how is this going? Where, 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 where am I? Am I doing the right thing? And my sense is as a, as a, as a government, the UK never ever had that. And that goes to this idea of being uh, 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 of the two levels of thinking at this very critical ability, how am I wrong? How, how am I wrong? Where's my contingency? And, and, mm -hmm. and think about when you're prepping for a negotiation, you should be thinking through, all right, I think I have a pretty good sense. How am I wrong? Mm -hmm. How could I, and if I am wrong, what am I going to change to? And mm -hmm. so I, I just thought yeah. there was never, and arguably they should have had the, they could, they could have uh, before everything started figured out that maybe we had left less leverage than we think. Mm -hmm. But certainly it seems to me that in the early, from what I understand in the early times when they should have been thinking, wait a second here, mm -hmm. how are we wrong? How are we, how, how have we maybe potentially misread completely the leverage who has leverage and who doesn't here and what the stakes are for the other side. I, I got the sense that that would never happen until too mm -hmm. late mm -hmm. for a yeah, variety of political answer. and personal right. reasons, you know. Right, right. Yeah, they, they so you this sort idea, of charge. I think it's, it's so critical and, it, and it's again, it ties together that 
the actor and director, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're, if we take this theater, this theater metaphor, right? You're not just the, you're a, you're a playwright. You mm -hmm. write the lines, you write the script, you, you come from the right. cauliflower, you come up, you say, I think what you mean minister is right. for me to take your offer and go you. So you're writing the lines and you're acting, you're in a role, but you're also a director. You're also right. able to right. work at that meta level of saying, right. how is everything going here? Right. Which I'm, I, am I, am I yeah. meeting my counterpart? Which suggests to me, Dave, that um, that your book is awesome and it's gonna it's got great <laughs> tips in it for the for us. But if you're gonna be handling the Brexit negotiations, uh, you want to be the Yuja Wang who's been studying for this for her whole life and not just some guy. So that's just yeah. my you know my plug for the power of the expert here. So I don't know if there was just a guy. I'm gonna pull back a little bit, but yeah. but you want someone who really knows how to do how to play with both hands, how to play and listen yeah. and. And that's the Yuja Wang story, right? I mean, here's a brilliant woman who's been doing this for a long time, who is the, the best in the world. That's the person you want playing the piano, and, right? And the more, if you can command the idiom, yeah, you can deal with complexity. Yeah. Sim simple people don't deal with complexity well. Right. They right. come up with simple solutions or they right. set a track and can't vary. So, right. so being able to be part of command of the idiom and understanding the negotiation game deeply is I can handle complexity. Right. It doesn't freak me out. It doesn't, uh, I can adjust. I know, right. in fact, I'm anticipating that I'm gonna have to vary the path and, and that's right. not gonna freak me out. That's okay. I, I right. can command the idiom. You have to update. I, can, yeah. I, can, I can update. Yeah, you have to update. Nice. So I have, a, I have another kind of tactical one and it's perfect. I'm going to ask this of you. I'm sorry if I'm not getting to your question. So in the interest of time, I may not. Um, but, but here's one and it's about, the question is how do you create your BATNA? Which for anybody who has, who has read Fisher and Yuri's book, which Dave mentioned much earlier in our session, I'm getting to yes, you will know that this stands for a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So essentially it's your outside option. So if this, if I can't buy this house, do I have another one? If I can't, if this person doesn't accept my marriage proposal, I got someone waiting in the wings, right? You got someone else that's waiting for you. So the question is, um, one is how do you create it? And my guess is you gotta do some legwork, right? But you actually have a Good really- answer. Yeah, yeah, you actually have a really good alternative way of thinking of this because in the book, which I'm showing you, if you buy it and read it, you will learn this, is that the data around and um, BATNAs is not very encouraging, right? So it's not necessarily the best way forward. So you offer something else, Dave. Can you talk about yeah. the BAWNA? Yeah, so there's two There's two ideas. Let's talk about, let's stick with, so this best alternative to a negotiated agreement is, as, as Kath suggests, you got to do some legwork, get other offers, right? right? If you can, get other offers. That's your alternative. Right. People tend, people tend to do two two big mistakes with the BATNA. One is they they deceive themselves in ways that hurt themselves. So they say, oh, I need to be strong. I need to be tough here. And so even though I have my other offer is a um, 30,000 euro salary, let's say we're in a job setting, right? I'm gonna go in this negotiating with, negotiation with a potential new employer. I'm gonna say, no, my baton is really 35,000. That, that is super ineffective and it just potentially puts you in a position that you don't wanna be. So the advice is, and I think this is, you would offer this, and this is pretty well known in the literature now, don't play games with your baton. Your baton is your baton. Be optimistic but you gotta be like, it is what it is. Um, don't play games with it. If you're looking to use your BATNA for motivation, don't do that. Motivation comes from setting a goal, saying, I wanna get a 50,000 euro salary. That's my goal. I'm gonna put my BATNA over on the side. So there's, that's a, that's a huge mistake. You, you generate motivation and toughness from having a specific goal that you can commit to and not, and, and realizing that in the end, and I think I portray this as um, imagine, um, imagine Pico was in that white sheeted room and 
I'll uh, put an envelope on the table in front of him and it said, this is your one and true final offer you get to visit or you get to free one of the 11 hostages. Would Pico take it? Of course he would take it if it was really true because that's his batna is he's got no, Nothing. there are no hostages free. Right. So I have to take right. that. So you want to be right. super rational about it. So that's that's the batna. So don't make the mistake of, uh, um, and there's some some complexities around set, uh, how to be optimistic uh, that I don't want to bug us down in, in right now. It's in the book. It's in it's one in step ahead. It, it's in the book because it's not quite as simple. How do you be optimistic? Yeah. And what do you do if your batna is really bad? Well, you might be better off not having a batna at all. Just shove it Say away. that. I, I think that, so Dave, can we join together in that? Like, forget your batna. Forget, forget your, your batna. batna. Yeah, get out there, it. man, and crap. raise your ambitions. Read yeah, a book there and you get go. into the idiom and get it. Get, set your ambitions high, ladies and gentlemen. Right, just Absolutely. run at it. All right. Absolutely. So, Fair enough. so the what's the B A W N A? So the B A W N A is again something that I don't think is in the literature till I started thinking about it, which is best alternative within a negotiated agreement, which is okay. There's a lot of different things that my counterpart and I might agree on, and they could take a variety of forms. Um, so why this is where the creativity comes in. And, and when we, a, a standard kind of negotiating textbook or negotiation course, if it's a bat, not bat, not goal. But there's so much room here for thinking about deals. And let me give you a, a great example from Pico himself. So he had freed, um, he had freed nine of the of the eleven hostages, and um, there were two German hostages still in captivity. And they they had been take the Germans had been taken in retaliation for the German government having jailed a pair of brothers from the Hamadi clan, uh, one of whom had partnered with Abdullah Imad Munia in the TWA hijacking in the in the um, 1980s. So the final piece of the negotiation was especially pro problematic for Pico because the Hamadi's original proposal, the family's proposal um, was a two for two swap. So they'd swap um, the two German hostages for the two brothers who were in prison in Germany. It was impossible under German law and was unacceptable to most of the other parties involved. Since a swap was off the table, Pico's critical planning task was to come up with an alternative deal structures that might be accepted by the Hamadi family, the German government, and the other parties less directly involved. As he flew to Frankfurt for the last stage of bargaining, Pico created 11 options to raise with the Germans. So this is Pico writing in his memoir. They range from allowing the Hamadi brothers to play soccer football together, to the most ingenious, I thought, which would be a program of artificial insemination for their wives, since one of the Hamadi's complaints was that an Arab husband without children was a man held in contempt. So that's the idea that he came up with 11 different possible deal structures. So spending more time um, thinking about, and this brings together a lot of the different themes that we've talked about. You're trying to anticipate in the other side what kind of deal structure might work for them? And this is a very different world from the getting to yes, where it, 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 it's kind of the getting to yes problem is as though we're just identify your BATNA, identify the interests on the other side, as though these things are just sitting right. there. When any psychologist, any clinical psychologist, right. we're talking about wants, we're talking about right. interests, these, these things. And Dale Carnegie, of all people, had a had a beautiful phrase is that what you're trying to do is arouse an eager want in the other side. Well, part of how you do that is think about different options and realize mm -hmm. their wants or their interests mm -hmm. or their needs right. are malleable and you can right. affect them, you can create them, you that's part of the power you have. Right. That's really lovely. I love it. I love sort of ending um, some of the tactical uh, bits on that notion of be creative. So I love your Bauna. How do you pronounce B-A-W-N-A? Bauna. Bauna? Bauna? Yeah, I'll go with Copyright. Bauna. Copyright. We got we to register you, account. You do. Yeah. So Bauna <laughs> is great because it really is within what you know about the other side that Pico comes up with 11 crazy ideas that might just 
work right? They might just work. So you can't leave it. He can't leave it to the other side to invent these options, right? He's got to be thinking very creatively about what might work, right? But he also has to listen. He, he you know, in his own culture, when I read that, when they read, read the story and you just described it, within his own culture, he may not have thought about insemination of the wives, right? But you have to listen and understand that there's something that might be really appealing for them, right? That you could at least meet that interest if he's still in captivity, right? So really, really nice, really lovely. So, so in our remaining moments, I do wanna show again, one step ahead. Uh, is it reverse for you? One step ahead, um, mastering the art and science. Oh, that's gorgeous, of negotiation. We've got a handful of additional questions, but I think they're all under the same um, point, which is, um, and then one of them came in from the live stream. So you said, great negotiators are made, not born which I hope is true because that's what we do for a living is, is uh, teach people how to do it well. And that's what the book is about. So the question is what other books might you suggest in the sequence? So there's no question that this is um, chock full of ideas and great stories that really make the advice come alive. I think in ways that I haven't seen before. You mentioned um, Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah, great. And then the second one you mentioned was Fisher and Yuri's classic, Getting to Yes. Yep. And these have limitations, right? There's not a lot of empirical evidence in the Carnegie book. And the- um, Not a lot of empirical evidence in the Getting to Yes book. Actually, you're quite right about that. Well, hey, there is close uh, talk. Close no, talk. There's some good close talk <laughs> data. Um, but you're right. That's exactly right. So some of those are limited. Is there anything else that's on the market if they wanted to say, so- so they buy this one at their local bookshop and then there might be another one. Is there anything else? I would say the Fisher um, is a nice one. Yeah, it's a nice one. Um, uh, what's, the, what's the Baserman Melotra? Negotiation oh, Superstars? Negotiating or Genius. Ge negotiating genius. genius. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good that's one. Pretty good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I, yeah. Don't buy that I, one in, in lieu of Dave's book. Of no, one, no. And I got to say, um, if you buy one step ahead and believe the framing, and this is what I used to tell students, yeah, believe the framing of negotiation is just but one example of, of, of social life, social interaction as interweaving of minds, as drama, as then you can read anything. Guess what? You're watching Bridgerton, mm -hmm. then... Right. There's a lot of negotiation. There's yeah, like understanding. Enough. So I, th I think to go back to a point that you brought up, Kath, yeah. just chapter two is like, uh, uh, goes against the idea that, oh, negotiate, you know, you can negotiate everything. Sure, you can, but why would you? That's an idiot. That is like, that's for, right. that's for rookies. Why would you right. negotiate everything when you have power, when you have authority, right. when you have right. all kinds of other ways to do what you want to do? And right. so- there's this idea that well, all of life, all of life is a negotiation. Kind of fits with that, right? Mm -hmm. And and I said, no, that's that's wrong. But you know what? A, a, a negotiation is all of life. Mm -hmm. Everything. So let me. Yeah. Maybe this is a good way to end. If I can find that, is um, David, you look it up. Can I say yes. we've got 30 seconds left? We are being um, alerted that we don't, I've got this great advanced copy, um, okay. but some are saying I'm in the Amazon shop in the UK and I can't find it yet. So it, it, it's a different, it's a different cover should be in the Amazon shop in the UK. It's just going to okay. look like a different, it's got a different cover for the UK. I see. Okay, fine. Uh, and who's version. the publisher? St. Martin's Press? Is that the publisher no, here in the UK? No, that's, that's US. The publisher there is One World. One world and one, one world. world. One step yeah. ahead. And I can, one if world. you go to if you go to my um, if you go to uh, my um, uh, Twitter feed, you can find you can find, you it. Can find it. it. It better be an Amazon UK or my publisher here is going to hear a about really it. Bad job. So I think so, so Dave. I'm going to stop us here. Yes, we're, we're just at time. I just found so, it. Okay, good, yeah. good, good, good. They'll have to read. Which app? What page is it? 50. All right, they have to tune into Nice round 50. number. Very good. Re re it's nice easy. round number. Nice inviting yeah, round number. Yes. Absolutely. I like it. I'm going to call time. Thanks so much, on Chris. 
Thank, thank you guys. so thank much. You, this has already been the highlight of my academic year, uh, end of <laughs> calendar 2021. Um, while the bar is low, this far exceeded the, the bar <laughs> that's been set by, by this academic year and the pandemic. But I really wanted to thank um, everyone who came, everyone who listened. Um, hopefully they, they learned something, uh, hopefully it inspired them to think about themselves on the stage of life that they inhabit and that they act upon. Um, I know I learned a few things that I didn't know before, and we didn't even talk about football, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, Professor Kathleen O'Connor from London Business School and Dave Sally, who is a professor at Dartmouth. But of course, more than anything, a really wonderful friend. So thanks, everyone, for coming. And see you thanks, next Chris. time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, LSE. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, School of Public thanks, Policy. Kat. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone.